Good evening, beautiful packed Wheeler Centre crowd. I can't think of a better night for it. My name is Louise Wynn, I'm an editor and publisher. And I respectfully acknowledge that we're meeting today on the traditional land of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and the elders from other communities who may be here today. Nathan Hill was born in Iowa in 1975 and lives with his wife in Naples, Florida. He's worked as a journalist and is now an Associate Professor of English at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. The Nix is his debut novel. It was named the number one book of the year by Entertainment Weekly, as well as one of the year's best books by the New York Times, the Washington Post, Amazon, Newsday, and the list goes on and on. Comparisons have been made to David Foster Wallace, John Irving, Jonathan Franzen, Michael Chabon, and more. And you only need read the first page to understand why. It's a book that is so engrossing that you will put your iPhone down for hours. Please make very welcome, Nathan Hill. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. We're gonna start with a little reading to get us in the mood. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everybody for coming out tonight, especially on a, such a nice night tonight. I, I was I had the pleasure of walking around this great city last night. I I, I got here early and had nothing to do, so I was just walking. I, I got down to the botanic gardens around sunset, and I was just like walking. And it's such you have such a beautiful city. So lucky you. I'm full of envy. Um, <laughs> uh, I would like to just read to you uh, from the beginning of the novel. Um, uh, this is uh, chapter one, uh, and uh, just a couple pages to get give you the flavor. Um, uh, and the, uh, it begins, the, the, this is the, the action that makes the, the rest of the novel uh, spin forward. The headline appears one afternoon on several news websites almost simultaneously. Governor Packer attacked. Television picks it up moments later, bumping into programming for a breaking news alert as the anchor looks gravely into the camera and says, we're hearing from our correspondents in Chicago that Governor Sheldon Packer has been attacked. And that's all anyone knows for a while, that he was attacked. And for a few dizzying minutes, everyone has the same two questions. Is he dead? And is there video? <laughs> the first word comes from reporters on the scene who call in with cell phones and are put on the air live. They say Packer was at the Chicago Hilton hosting a dinner and speech. Afterward, he was making his way with his entourage through Grant Park, glad handing, baby kissing, doing all your typical populist campaign maneuvers, when suddenly from out of the crowd, a person or a group of people began to attack. What do you mean attack, the anchor asks. He sits in a studio with shiny black floors and a lighting scheme of red, white, and blue. His face is smooth as cake fondant. Behind him, people at desks seem to be working. He says, could you describe the attack? All I actually know right now, the reporter says, is that things were thrown. What things? That is unclear at this time. Was the governor struck by any of the things? Is he injured? I believe he was struck, yes. Did you see the attackers? Were there many of them throwing the things? There was a lot of confusion and some yelling. The things that were thrown, were they big things or small things? I guess I would say small enough to be thrown. <laughs> were they larger than baseballs, the thrown things? No, smaller, so golf ball sized things. Maybe that's accurate. Were they sharp? Were they heavy? It all happened very fast. Was it premeditated or a conspiracy? There are many questions of that sort being asked. A logo is made, terror in Chicago. It whooshes to a spot next to the anchor's ear and flaps like a flag in the wind. The news displays a map of Grant Park on a massive touchscreen television and what has become a commonplace of modern newscasting, someone on television communicating via another television, standing in front of the television and controlling the screen by pinching it with his hands and zooming in and out in super high definition. It all looks really cool. 
While they wait for new information to surface, they debate whether the incident will help or hurt the governor's presidential chances. Help, they decide, as his name recognition is pretty low outside of a rabid conservative evangelical following who just loves what he did during his tenure as governor of Wyoming, where he banned abortion outright and required the Ten Commandments to be publicly spoken by children and teachers every morning before the Pledge of Allegiance, and made English the official and only legal language of Wyoming, and banned anyone not fluent in English from owning property. <laughs> also, he permitted firearms in every state wildlife refuge. Mm. And he issued an executive order requiring requiring state law to supersede federal law in all matters, a move that amounted to, according to constitutional scholars, a fiat secession of Wyoming from the United States. He wore cowboy boots. He held press conferences at his cattle ranch. He carried an actual live real gun, a revolver that dangled in a leather holster at his hip. At the end of his one term as, as governor, he declared he was not running for re-election in order to focus on national priorities, and the media naturally took this to mean he was running for president. He perfected a sort of preacher-slash-cowboy pathos and an anti-elitist populism and found a receptive audience, especially among blue-collar white conservatives, put out by the current recession. He compared immigrants taking American jobs to coyotes killing livestock, and when he did this, he pronounced coyotes pointedly with two syllables, coyotes. Thank you. <laughs> If we could just block out the next few days, we could just have the whole book read to us. <laughs> I think that would be, you should do your own audio book. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that all sounds kind of familiar. This book begins with a remarkably trunk, Trump like. <laughs> trunk, I like that. <laughs> Trump like right wing presidential candidate, but that was all written long before Trump came to power. Are you a soothsayer? And can you send him back? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, the book came out at the end of August in the US. And, uh, and so in my, my book tour, before the election happened, everybody thought that I had written that character, uh, Sheldon Packer, mm. uh, as a kind of, I don't know, uh, um, satire of Trump. And, mm. and, and, the, and, the, and the truth is, I wrote that character about eight years ago. Um, and uh, it just kind of mm. sat there. Uh, I. I I wrote it because I thought it would be funny, honestly. I thought I wanted to write something that was absurd. Mm. And, and then, and then every, everybody's asking me like, oh, you must, have, you must have written it based on the current political season, which is uh, maybe a lesson on how quickly uh, reality can catch up to fiction in terms of absurdity. Mm, and how in touch you were with maybe the undercurrent. <laughs> um, I, I don't, I, I'll take credit for that, I guess. Uh, um, uh, there were a few things. There were a few things um, that that were pretty obvious for for a while in mm. the U.S. Um, that that came to a head in in this last uh, election. Certainly, the fact that we have um, a media culture that is headline driven. Um, the idea behind that first uh, chapter is that uh, is that the person who's throwing um, you find out it's rocks. Somebody's throwing rocks at the governor, um, and, and it turns out she has a kind of past with the hippie uh, uh, movement in the '60s, and everybody just their opinion just crystallizes very quickly, oh, you know, like left-wing hippie who hates the, the, the conservative politics mm. of, this, of this governor, and, uh, and, uh, and that kind of closes down the conversation. And the work of the rest of the book is to, is to make you recognize that there's much more to that headline. Mm. Um, I guess I was responding to something that's happening, um, at least in, in my culture, where it, it feels like we give everything about 15 seconds of attention and then render a verdict in our heads, you know, like or dislike, and, and uh, um, we have all this data uh, available to us, like every uh, every bit of knowledge out mm. there, but it's it's incredibly scary and maybe ontologically destabilizing to <laughs> to to try to sift through all of it. So, what's happening in the U.S. I think, and what I deal with in this book is uh, is this phenomenon where um, our defense against all this information is just to kind of believe what I believe already and and uh, disbelieve anything that doesn't that doesn't uh, um, hold up what my my own biases. And uh, I'll believe what I believe, and you believe what you believe, and mm. we'll just disagree. Uh, and so I, I guess that's what I'm reacting to. And then we, we saw that in, in technicolor detail uh, with, uh, with our election this last November. Mm. 
What a time to be alive. <laughs> I, was in, I was in a book tour in Berlin when the election happened. I, w I woke up to find out what had happened, and then I had a radio interview that morning. It was supposed to be about my book, but every question was about Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah. You are not the spokesperson for America. Here, I, was, I was that day. Yeah. <laughs> So where to start with this sprawling tome? I mean, people say novels need to be shorter now because we've got this sort of shorter, so-called shorter attention span. And then you've come out with this whopping 620 page tome. What do you say to people who think that we don't, we can't read it anymore, these long books? Uh, well, I don't know. I think um, I, it's not like I, I, I didn't set out to write a long book. I really didn't. Like hilariously, when I started the book, I thought it was going to be a short story. I really did. Uh, and, uh, and, and, but I, 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 I had the story in mind, and it, it sort of kept growing on me, and the book became a, a, a bit of a repository for some of the ideas I was having. Um, and, uh, and I worked on it for a very long time. I said, I'm, I'm sorry if you were listening, I said on the radio this morning, so I'll just repeat myself, uh, I, I said that uh, if you have you know, two good ideas per year, and you work on a book for 10 years, it gets kind of big, you know? And, <laughs> uh, and that's kind of what happened. Um, very slowly, I, I started having these ideas that seemed to fit. The book seemed to accommodate these, 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 new, um, these new things. So, um, but in terms of attention span, I don't know. Uh, um, I, I, I'm worried about attention span. I, 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 I taught uh, at a university for 10 years. Um, mm. I taught... Uh, like intro writing uh, um, classes, you know, like first year classes, like here's how to write a college essay, an academic argument. I taught that class, and uh, and I know that um, that that cell phones and and social media were a disaster for some of my students who could not pull themselves away. I would I would uh, assign let's say like a five page essay for people to read, um, and they would come back and say that essay made no sense at all. None. And I'm, I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, I don't understand, because I think it was pretty easy to follow mm -hmm. until I did um, this inventory, asked people how many, how many text message conversations and Facebook conversations and tweets and so, you know, how, how many of these things were happening while you were also reading. And I, it came... While they were reading while the they were reading, page. Yeah. So they, they, they'd read a couple paragraphs and then stop and check Facebook, check Twitter, oh. and, you know, and, uh, and then they would read a couple paragraphs and then somebody would text and they would have a back and forth. And I realized mm -hmm. what was going on, um, which is that, well, I mean, people are incapable of multitasking in that way. You don't multitask, mm. you just kind of forget what you were doing before. Uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, I am, I'm really deeply concerned about that. But I think the answer to that isn't to write really short books. Mm. <laughs> you know, the, the answer to that is to write maybe really long ones, mm. to tr you know, train people <laughs> to, mm. to maybe remember how to, uh, to focus in that way. Um, but I, I can't say that I was thinking that at the time. The fact that it's a long book was mostly accidental, but uh, <laughs> yeah. There is there is a section in here where you've got um, uh, there's a teach teaching Hamlet and there's only a small handful who've actually read small handful sort of mm -hmm. a very small percentage who've actually read um, Hamlet, mm -hmm. which is not that long and it's incredibly infuriating. Do you find the nature of teaching from the teaching perspective, but also from the perspective of being a student? Do you think it's changed a lot in the last sort of 15, 20 years? I, th I think it has, and it, it was infuriating for me for a while. Um, uh, the, the, the teacher that I, that I was is very much like the teacher my main character Samuel is at the beginning of the Knicks, where he's, he's encountering these students um, who don't care what he has to say, uh, and he's just enraged mm. at them. Uh, and um, it wasn't until, I mean, that was sort of me for a while, and it wasn't until I, I started engaging the students, I guess, um, where engaging them where they were, uh, and and the thing I realized about a lot of my college students, and I don't know what it's like here, but 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 in the U.S., um, I was getting students who had grown up during a really really bad recession, mm. um, and in, in a world where jobs are tight, it's very competitive, and uh, and they had been told many many times by people who love them and are trying to look out for them, you need to go to college, you need to get that degree mm. uh, in something very practical and utilitarian, uh, and so they'd come to my class where I'm teaching poetry, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and I still believe in antique ideas like a, like a classical liberal education where you get, you're, you, you get a well-rounded introduction mm. to a lot mm. of different subjects and they don't believe that at all. And so we were two discursive ships passing in the night. Mm. Um, and, uh, and so it wasn't until I started trying to figure out how to talk to them about 
literature in a way that made sense to them, you know, like talking mm -hmm. about it in a very utilitarian way. Mm -hmm. What, what will this do for you? How will God. it make you better? <laughs> you know, like talking about it as yeah, if it yeah. were like exercise. Um, weirdly that worked, you know? Uh, and so a lot of, there's, there's a lot of like, uh, um, weirdly, uh, uh like, brain science and mm. neurobiolo neurobiology um, that, that some of it kind of slipped into the Knicks uh, because I was researching it in order to be able to talk to my students what happens in your mind when you, when you read something uh, long and hard. So hard that you actually have to convince them that it will make them a better person in some way in order for them to think that therefore they should listen in yeah. class. Yeah, well how do you convince someone who's majoring in finance to read a novel? Mm. Right, like mm. they think this is not this. It's not true. Yeah, What's um, the point? right. And what uh, there's this great article that came out in like 2008, 2009, um, or a study that came out in 2008 to 2009. And the the headline in the New York Times about this study was um, have a job interview, read a little Chekhov. And what these, yeah, seriously, <laughs> what these what these brain scientists had realized was that one of the best things you can do to uh, to understand what's going on in, in something like is something as complex as mm. office politics is to read a lot of really good fiction because fiction is mm. like a trial run. It's like virtual reality for the real world. Uh, and the and the more fiction you read, the more you are able to understand where other people are coming from. So the process that we that we use when we, when we try to understand characters in fiction mm. is the same process as when we try to understand people at work. And and so that kind of stuff. Like I would talk about that. Uh, to my students, and and and, uh, and 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 then once I got those great students who just wanted uh, wanted a great novel for the beauty of its lyrical sentences, like I do, then I would just I would I would be so happy, and we could talk in my office hours about the beautiful lyrical sentences. But for everybody else, it was very utilitarian. Well, you've convinced me. <laughs> <laughs> so when Samuel at one point tells Laura that she's not very smart and not a good person either, it's kind of a revenge fantasy for all uni teachers <laughs> who've ever had to put up with that student, that kind of obnoxious student who doesn't do the reading, kind of um, cheats and tries to bully top marks out of their teachers. But then you do this thing um, where we kind of get Laura's backstory and we start to maybe understand why she is the way she is and she's the product of her environment, of course. Of course she is. And we kind of made her you know, we're responsible for making her like that hurt. And then I kind of, in the end, I felt sorry for her in a oh, small good. way. And I wanted to know what you ended up making of that Laura character. Uh, if, you, if you haven't read it, Laura Potsdam is a second year university student who has so far cheated on every exam and, and, and paper that she's been given in college. Uh, and, and she's so driven by, by that pressure yeah. that's come from, rather than because she's there because she just wants to be there to learn, yeah. as you say. Uh, my first, in my first draft of writing Laura, um, I, I was very cruel to her. It felt like uh, an author was sitting on high and deriding somebody. Mm. Um, and I didn't like the feeling of that. It, mm. it, it felt a little icky to me. Um, mostly I was just like, it was, it was a kind of revenge fantasy. I was getting back at students that I had had. I had a student one time, like this is a true story. I had a student one time who, who turned in a plagiarized paper. And by the way, this not a semester went by when I didn't have a student who, who, who turned in a plagiarized paper. Mm. Um, but this student, it was just very clear, like like the entire paper came from this one website and it was very easy to track down. And, uh, and so I, I asked her to come into my office to talk about it. And I showed her the website and I showed her her paper and I'm like, these two are identical. And she looked at me and she said, that's weird. <laughs> I said, what do you mean weird? Uh, what, like, is it a coincidence? Like, and she said, I don't know, it's weird, but my dad's a lawyer. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, and so like that was that was the end of that conver conversation. Um, I had I had another. Okay, I'm sorry. One more. Okay, uh, I had another an another student. This was my first semester teaching, and I walked into the class, and I had 25 students in the class. I did my first class thing, and then two, a couple days later, the second class came, um, and 21 students of the 25 were still there, which I guess is not unusual. They shop around, you know. Yeah. Um, and so of the four students who dropped out, uh, three of them eventually. 
uh, disappeared off of my online role, but one name stayed on the role for the entire semester. I kept on waiting for it to disappear, and it never did. And then the last day of class, like three and a half months later, the last day of class, there's somebody new sitting in the back. And I say, hi, who are you? And she says this name, and it's the name from the role. She hasn't been there since the first class. I say, welcome back, and, uh, and I, I teach my class, and she comes up at the end of class, and she says, no joke, this is a direct quote, she said, so I think I've fallen a little behind in your class. <laughs> what extra credit can I do to get a good grade? Um, What's and she, the answer? What's the answer to that? Well, the answer to that was no, nothing. nothing, like, you know, you're going to fail. But my school had this policy where, where for that particular class, because it was like a, a required first year class, if she fails, she just takes it again, again next semester, and whatever grade she gets, it gets replaced, the F gets replaced by whatever she grade, grade she gets. Yeah, so right. it's, it's no big deal. And that's what I told her. And she was very upset with me. And then that night, or no, like a night or two later, uh, I, on a hunch, checked this website, ratemyprofessors.com. <gasps> I don't know if you're familiar with this website. Yeah, it's like yeah, Yelp for that. teachers, yeah. and there, were, sure enough, there's a brand new, uh, there's a brand new um, uh, um, review of me anonymously uh, that said I asked this guy for help and he didn't help me. He's a jackass, and and you know that's what what can I do? Um, and and so like when I first started writing the Laura Potsdam character, these were the kinds of students that mm. I had in mind, and I was like getting, I was I was having a really good time. Um, <laughs> really being mean to them uh, in my fiction. Uh, and, but then, you know, uh, fast forward a few years, and I've, I've sort of figured out, I think, I hope, how to, how to talk to my students a little bit better and, and uh, understand them a little bit better. And I come back to Laura, and I'm like, this is just too cruel. Um, and, and anyway, as, like, as soon as you start asking questions about somebody's inner life, you know, like, Laura doesn't think she's a bad person. Yeah. Like, just like everybody else, Laura feels like, like, the David to the Goliath that is the world. We mm -hmm. all feel that way. So in what way is she a good guy in her story? And mm -hmm. once you start asking those questions, it's hard to maintain that anger. So yeah, so I did soften towards Laura and I do feel, um, I do feel kind of bad for the pressure that she's under. And, and ultimately now I think she might be the smartest character in the novel. I think she's like brilliant. <laughs> I love the way that you describe it as you sort of wrote all these things and that was your kind of nastier self. And I guess that it sounds like in the process of writing this big book, you get to choose your best self. Is that, is that kind of what happens when you're... And, and you comment a bit on, on, the, on what it is to write a book and be an, be an author in, in yeah. the mix. Well, the thing about... Uh, so I worked on the book for 10 years and the thing about doing something for that long is... is you write something when you're 27, and then you go back to revise it when you're 30 something, mm. so 37, and you're like, I was a jerk, mm. you know? There's like this textual evidence of it, you know? Mm. Uh, and, uh, and, and unlike, unlike you know, memory where you can kind of change it, yeah. you know, and, and believe that you're, you're a much better person than maybe you really were, uh, there was like evidence of it. So in some ways, you know, just the passage of time and hopefully growing up a little bit and, uh, and, and the fact that it was just this direct evidence of, uh, of, of a kind of like angrier and more aggressive author than I think mm. the one that ultimately finished the book. <laughs> Did you end up writing the kind of book that you like to read? I did. I, ho I hope so. Um, I like to read, um, well, I don't know. I, I guess I don't really have a, a certain kind of book that I like to read, but I definitely do um, like to be, uh, I, I, like a, I like a good story. I like interesting characters, and I like to laugh. Mm. Uh, and so I guess I, I wrote a book that, that hopefully makes, makes you chuckle a few times along the way, uh, along with yeah. de delivering all this other bad news about the state of the world. Mm. It's how we like it. Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely the kind of book that I like to read. I got it twice for Christmas. Clearly people knew. <laughs> and there's a character who is, to understate, kind of very much into computer games in this book. Um, and it's a particular quest-type computer game. And you write like you understand precisely what it what it's like to not be able to walk away from the screen. Is that is that true? Did that come from first hand? Yeah. Uh, the, the character's name is... Ponage, it's spelled P-W-N-A-G-E. It comes from this word pwn, P-W-N. Does anybody know this word? Yeah. No, so. some people, no, most people don't, okay. Uh, uh, to pwn, um, uh, in the, uh, the legend goes, in the very early days of online gaming, if somebody were to beat somebody else really, really badly, they would write, they might write, um, I just owned you. 
uh, but the P key is right next to the O key. And so sometimes there would be mm -hmm. a typo. I just pwned you, P-W-N. And the internet being weird, it just kind of stuck. Mm. So to pwn somebody, P-W-N, means to beat them utterly at a video game. And uh, anybody who plays games knows this word, and anybody mm. who doesn't has no idea what they're talking about. Uh, so I thought it was an appropriate name for this character. You never get his real name. You only know his avatar's name, mm. Pwnage. So yeah, Pwnage has become addicted to this um, massively multiplayer online video game. Like um, completely addicted. Completely, it's yeah. It's taken over. Mm. Um, he's he kind of like, uh, uh, you know, um, dawn to dusk, and mm. sometimes later than that. Um, his his wife has has left him. He's lost his job, but he is incredibly, incredibly good at this game. Like the the best player on his server, um, mm. which uh, of you know, this is thousands of players. And yeah, he came he came out of a out of a, a certain time in my life. Uh, so uh, when I um, when I first moved to New York City in 2004, I just finished graduate school. I just finished a, an MFA in writing, mm -hmm. um, and I had uh, you know I moved to New York City. I was going to be a writer, and uh, and I had this day where I was between apartments, um, and uh, and so I put all my stuff in my car and went to work. And I came back, and the car was empty. Uh, it had been broken into, and my computer with all of my writing, like three years of writing and a manuscript in uh. progress, was gone. And including all the backup disks that I stupidly had in the car with it, uh, and like you know, clothes, books, money, all that stuff, it was all gone. Um, and uh, and so that was, um, I was pretty sad <laughs> about that uh, for a while. And um, uh, and uh, and and eventually, I, I got a, a, another computer, and um, it was just very difficult in, at the beginning in in New York. Like that happened, and um, the writing wasn't going very well. Um, I was working at the time at a nonprofit poetry organization. So you can imagine like what my salary was, you know, <laughs> living in New York City, and. Um, but my friend, a good friend of mine, said one night after I had um, scratched up enough money to buy an, a new computer, he said, I want you to buy this video game. I said, what's it called? He said, uh, World of Warcraft. I was like, what's that? And uh, he said, just don't worry about it, just buy it. And so I did, and we played it together. Um, and he has since told me that he, that he did that just so he could keep an eye on me. Like, he was worried about me, and we live far apart, uh, but we mm -hmm. could chat together. Uh, while we played the game, and so he was he was very sweet. Um, and uh, but fast forward like a couple years, um, he has stopped playing, and I keep going. Uh, I really like it. Uh, I and I don't I don't really know why. Like I got really good at it, and like mm. I even even I was even like um, I was going on raids and like conquering like the highest level stuff, and uh, and like uh, saying no to. Um, to social invitations because I had to go play this game with them, you know, you know, and this 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 went on for a couple of years, um, and then eventually I realized like, what am I doing? Like, I'm spending mm. all of my time with this game. I'm I'm spending more time playing this game than I am writing, you know, and so mm. eventually I, I I quit after a couple of years. I quit it and and haven't played it since, but. I wanted to put it in the in the novel because I had this weird kind of love hate relationship with it. On, on the one hand, um, I resented it for how mm. how much I played it, and, and frankly, it's embarrassing. Like if you tell your friends you have to go home because you have to play a game that like is also played by twelve year olds, it's sort of embarrassing, you know. Um, and so I resented it, but but also I was aware that it helped me through a tough time. Mm. You know, it was kind of emotionally analgesic, uh, and so. I liked that love-hate thing. I liked that ambiguity. Mm. Um, I think uh, I think I think my my best writing happens when I I'm I don't know exactly how I feel about something when it's confused or uh, um, uh, then there's there's the potential for for tension in that confusion. So mm. um, so I put it into the book and and so Ponage is the is the result of of that that um, that really weird time in my life. Mm. So you don't write with a with an end. You, not like John Irving, who I know he's quoted uh, as adoring you and your book. And I think he always knows the end, doesn't he? Yeah, he when writes he... the last chapter first and then writes the rest of the novel to get there. I'm so jealous wow. of his process. I can't do that at all. Yeah. So you, did you, when you started it, did you have a sense of where you might finish? No, I had no idea. I... I, uh, <clears throat> I uh, did you start with all these characters? Uh, no, no. I I started. Um, so after all of my stuff was stolen, I 
eventually I had to write something new, mm. you know? And, and so uh, I decided to write about the, one of the most interesting things that I saw in the first month that I, uh, that I lived in New York City, which uh, was the, uh, the, the protests at the Republican National Convention at Madison Square Garden. Mm. Um, this was um, uh, when Bush Cheney were, they were um, up for reelection. Uh, the Iraq war was, was ongoing mm. and a lot of people uh, showed up to New York City to protest. Mm. And, and so, and I, and I, I had just moved there. So I went down and, and watched the whole thing. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that, uh, that a lot of the, a, a lot of media talking heads type people were saying in 2004, they were wondering whether it was going to be as violent as the Democratic National Convention in Chicago in 1968, mm. uh, when people showed up to protest uh, about the, the Vietnam War and, uh, and there was riots in the streets and, and uh, people, uh, police beating people with, with, uh, with clubs and such, mm. tear gas. And, and, and so they were wondering if it was going to be get that out of hand. Uh, and I guess that gave me my first inspiration for the story, that uh, the, the, a story about two generations of protest uh, a son who was at the 2004 protest in New York and a mother who had been at the 1968 protest in Chicago. Mm. And that's where it began. Um, and then it just was really slow. Um, the plot, when I sit down to write in the morning, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I, uh, and, and usually I just kinda, I, I, I kinda go and usually a sentence will take me this direction or that. Uh, and, and so I don't recommend that, that's horribly inefficient. Um, but it allowed. But you wrote the Knicks, so well, we're okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think that it's good to know that there are writers who do that. Yeah, I, 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 I find that when I when I try to plot something out ahead of time, it's dead on arrival. Mm. I, I, my the the plots that I come up with um, uh, when I just try to chart everything out end up to being like borrowed from Hollywood, and they're just not very good. And so it's and it's. You much, mean it's kind of predictable? As yeah, you that's it. that's yeah. right. That's exactly right. So I I find that um, uh, that when I can surprise myself, mm. then the reader is probably also going to be surprised. Mm. Well, amongst all of the other things that the Nix is, it's got this ghost story in it. Mm. Um, and I'm wondering if that was part of your intention or if that just, you know, if you've got a background and interest in ghost stories and also whether the Nix was always the title. I mean, it's such a striking, such a striking title and it looks so good <laughs> on the cover. A nice short word. I must remember that. It's great. Thanks. So, was that always how it was? No, the, that was the title, uh, that, that became the title literally the day before we sent it out to publishers. Wow. Yeah, for 10 years it had a different title. And it actually, Can you tell us? Yeah, yeah um, so the first sentence I wrote that ended up being part of the Nix was uh, a scene where um, a young man is at that protest in 2004. And one mm. of the things that happened in, in 2004, uh, uh, there's this group that made, um, that made hundreds of um, cardboard coffins and draped the American flag over the coffins and marched down mm. the street in a very solemn procession meant to symbolize Iraq war dead. And uh, I thought it was a very moving, mm. moving march and a very moving image. Um, and so um, I had my first scene that I wrote uh, was a young man carrying one of those coffins. And the, lo the line was, um, there's a body for each of us. Uh, mm. And that, was, that became the title because it was the first sentence. A body for each of us body was of the, us. the title for 10, 11, 12 years. Mm. And, um, and it still is the title on my computer back home. Um, but mm. that was appropriate for that first version of the story, but it, it became inappropriate for the, it doesn't really capture the, the what the book became. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and so I was going back and forth with my, with my agent about uh, better titles and uh, we have a whole list of them uh, mm. that, that, that didn't seem to work, but the Knicks ended up working. Um, it's based on um, the spirit from Norwegian uh, folklore. Um, it didn't occur to me to title it this at the beginning because the, the actual proper name for this ghost in Norway is, uh, I think, the Nokken, N-O-K-K-E-N. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what I had used in my first draft. But uh, another word for that same ghost is a Nix. And I like the word play in English with the word Nix. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, we, went, we went, went with that. If you haven't read the book, uh, a Nix is a spirit of the water that will sometimes Times appear to uh, to young children as a beautiful white horse, mm. and it will tempt it tempt the kids to climb aboard. And if they do, it'll run them into the water and drown them. Mm. And uh, and it's it's a old Norwegian story. My family uh, uh, emigrated from Norway to the U.S. a few generations back, so those stories kind of always meant something to me. Mm. Uh, and um, 
And I don't know, the moral of that story seemed to me that, like, you know, when the, when, the, when the horse was presenting itself to the kid, it must have been, like, the best thing that ever happened to that kid, right? Your mm -hmm. very own horse. Uh, and, uh, and so the moral seemed to be, like, sometimes the things that you want the most or love the most end up hurting you the worst. Mm -hmm. and, and I realized that was happening to all of my characters. They're all undermined by the, the very people or the very things that mean the most to them. So it became a kind of obvious title once we thought about mm -hmm. it. I love the way things are starting to kind of all fall into place as you write it. I'm getting this real sense of how you sit down and you don't know and then suddenly, slowly, things start to come together. Yeah, it's really gratifying when it works. It's really headache producing, you know, most of the, most of the time when it doesn't. Yeah, uh, so I guess more of the time it's not doing that. Yeah, most yeah. of the time it's, it's um, I'm having fun with it, but, but it's also, um, you know, uh, when I first started writing Ponage, I had no idea how he would relate to the rest mm. of the book. And, and in some ways I thought Ponage was going to be a separate novel altogether mm. um, and then, then figured out that, no, he's, he's relevant and, and, and how he could fit into the plot. Um, but it takes, sometimes it takes a long time. At what point could you sit there and kind of actually be sort of glad that you felt like you were doing what you wanted to do that you didn't know that you wanted to do, if you see what I mean. Oh. oh. Was it late in the piece? <laughs> What's that? W was it late in the piece that you got that feeling? That it was coming together? Yeah. Yeah, I guess it was very, very late. It was like, you know, year seven, you know, yeah, right. uh, you know, and, at, you know, when you've work, been working on a book that long, it gets to be just kind of embarrassing, like your friends don't believe you. You know, <laughs> you know, like they don't believe I, you're writing. Yeah, at all. right. I went to school with a lot of very, very good writers who all had, you know, one, two, in one case, like six books come out mm. in the same time that I was doing my one, and they'd be like, "You're still working on that book?" I'd be uh. like, "Yeah." Uh, it gets to be horribly embarrassing. Um, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I guess I, I kind of stopped talking about it, uh, and uh, and um, I, yeah. I was teaching. I really threw myself into that. I, I really wanted to be a good teacher, uh, and uh, I was doing some scholarship and uh, and um, what. And the only the only person who knew anything about the the, the novel was 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 my wife. Mm. Um, we had this tradition where she she asked me to 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 read her the new pages. I write longhand with like pen and paper um so and old school yeah and and she can't read my handwriting so so she's so every couple nights she'd be like read me your pages so i'll read her the pages so she heard the entire um uh, novel in audio form uh out of order uh, before anybody read it and i it, it was very helpful like she's she's not a writer she's a musician um uh and uh, but and so she's coming at it from a different mm. perspective than i might and uh and she's very very helpful um I, I would know that that it was going well if she'd she'd ask me like oh what happens next this is so mm. good and i i would know that it was going poorly if she said that's really nice <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What do you think it does to your writing to write longhand in this day and age? Is I, that a deliberate thing or you just that's how you do it? It is, it? yeah, it's a deliberate thing. Um, I because I don't plot anything out ahead of time, because I'm exploring as mm. I'm going, I have to be slow. Mm. I have to allow myself enough time to figure out what's going on. If I'm on a computer, it's just too fast. Uh, just I, yeah, I, right. I can type too fast. Uh, and so um, I don't, I, I think I just have better ideas when I'm, when I'm going slowly and I have a pen. I just feel like I'm more connected to the process. Mm. And is it also that you can't get as distracted if you don't have a computer? Yeah, it's, that might be it. Like the, uh, on a computer, the delete key is so, it's so mm. uh, um, uh, seductive. Mm. You know, you, 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 you want to... Um, you want to make that sentence perfect, but sometimes mm. making a perfect sentence is the antithesis of writing a first draft. Sometimes you just have to be messy and sloppy and just get it done. Mm. Um, I know a friend of mine who who, who uh, is a writer and, and writes on a computer, but he uh, on on the the backspace or delete key or whatever you call it, um, he uh, he glued an upside down tack. <clears throat> You know, like a needle, uh, uh, so that he he could delete something <laughs> if he wanted, but but it would there it would be painful to do, to do, um, and so that's how he solved that that's problem. That's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. We're all going to be going home and getting taxed. <laughs> so there's this really long sentence in this book. It's chapter three of section eight. It's eleven pages. The one sentence, and it was one of those things where. I think I got sort of halfway through before I kind of really realised that there hadn't been a full stop yet. Yeah. And then it carried on. But it, and on you know, and on. And <laughs> in the best possible way. Was, it, was that intentional? Like, did you start the sentence thinking... What, did I accidentally write an 11-page <laughs> sentence? <Yeah. laughs> you woke up and there was this... I mean, did you set out to when it started? Or was it 
that you it's carry it's sort of happened as you were doing it and it just felt right, if you see what I mean. <laughs> um, I'm glad that you didn't notice for half half like five pages. I'm really I it's it's as best as I could make it, it's gramma it's a grammatically correct eleven page sentence. Yeah. Um and uh and I And it feels right. Yeah. It's and, not Somebody, yeah. um, somebody on Twitter uh, recently t was talking about the 11-page sentence, and somebody else responded, I didn't notice that mm. it, w it was one sentence, which really made me feel pretty good. Mm. Um, mm. I wanted it to be a kind of like thing in the background that caused like a little bit of anxiety, but you didn't know why, you know? Um, yeah, how did, it, how did it come about? Uh, <laughs> uh, it's... Um, it came about. Uh, I was uh, I, I was writing Ponage, and uh, and and I knew I wanted to write a chapter where he tried to quit this video game he's obsessed with, but it's very very difficult for him to do that. Uh, and uh, and so in my first draft, I just was making a list. Uh, I just mm -hmm. started. Today was the day he would stop playing video games, and then I started listing all the reasons why he couldn't possibly stop playing video games, mm -hmm. like every excuse in the book. And um, I, I wasn't doing it in paragraph form or anything. It was just a list. And then as is our tradition. Um, mm. I was reading it out loud to my wife and she said, is this one sentence? Because mm. it sounded like it in list form. And I said, no, it's just a list. But then that, that comment kind of stuck. Mm. And I got to thinking, why not? You know, why not do mm. it as, as one sentence? Like, uh, uh, here, here, here is this character who is trying to quit the one thing that he's good at, the one thing that gives him meaning, you know? And, and of mm. course it's going to be difficult. And I thought maybe doing it in one sentence, I could replicate the kind of um, claustrophobia and the, the kind of, yeah, recursive mm. kind of thing that's going on in his head um, uh, in syntactic form, that, that the same panic that he's feeling, maybe I could, I could give a little bit of that to the reader where they're constantly waiting for that, for that end stop and not getting it. So, mm. so yeah, that's, that's how it evolved. I have to say, I've never understood the feeling of wanting to continue to play computer games until I read his character. Yeah. And that's sort of around that area in the book. It just, it's the first time it really made sense because you get inside his head so well. And it, until then, I'd just been like, just stop and get on with your life, <laughs> right. you know. But that, and you do that, of course, with all of your characters, is you make it clear where they're coming from. And, of course, that's... Such a huge talent. But I believe that in those 10 years, you almost gave up writing and became a photographer. That's right. How do you know that? Because Julie Coe, who told me. Oh, I Julie told me. Okay, right. Yeah, this I, was in, week. I was I had a I had a, an event with Julie in Perth just a few days ago. Um, yeah, I did. Well, you know, there was there was a there was a time when um, the writing this was pretty pretty early, maybe year year four, and I was I was I was maybe, you know, putting together you know, 20 pages, uh, you know, a month, you know, like handwritten, like it was just, it was not happening. And mm -hmm. those 20 pages were really bad, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I don't know, like, I think, I think like there's this, there's this period that every, you know, writer and artist, actor, whatever mm. goes through, you're just like this, this, there's, there's some inevitable failure, you know, while, while your talent catches up with your taste. You know, and mm. uh, uh, and such a good way of putting it. <laughs> uh, and uh, and so I was going through that, and I wasn't, I don't know, I wasn't writing very much, and I just felt like I needed some kind of outlet mm. um, to to be creative, but mm. not feel like a total failure all the time. And so I started taking pictures, um, and uh, and I, I did it, um, you know, as a hobby for a long time, and then weirdly I started getting paid for it. And as it turned out, there was a way bigger market for pictures than there is for literary fiction, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> and so I started doing portraits um, and. Um, uh, and wow, that was, so it that was, actually worked for you. It, it did for a little bit. Yeah. Um, I know that that um, that uh, that. But it was it was filling a gap for me. It was filling this kind of uh, need, like I like this need to kind of create something. Um, because as soon as I figured out what I was doing with a novel, I kind of put it away. And so now I, I bring out, bring out my camera on like cool vacations. But other than that, I don't I don't I don't shoot anymore. But it got you through over the hump. Mm -hmm, right. Oh, everyone who's got who's been struggling for a few years is very emboldened by the ten years <laughs> and they're getting through this journey. Um, I think that we're probably at a point where we can open to some some uh, questions from the the floor. We've got people who uh, have got microphones. Um, if you've got a question to ask, Nathan. Um, 
just stick your stick your hand up. Ah, oh, we've got one here. Since it took so long to get your first book written and then published, has your publisher put a time limit on the second book? <laughs> <laughs> um, my publisher is very sweet. They haven't even mentioned the second book. I, I, yeah, <laughs> they, uh, I think they're, they're, they, um, they're allowing me uh, as much time and space as, uh, as I need. Um, I've started working on it. Um, I'm maybe 50 or 60 pages into it, uh, and um, <clears throat> uh, it's... Um, I'm in that exploratory phase right now. I, I have some characters and some themes and upsetting. I don't know what the plot's going to be and probably won't figure that out for another year or two. But uh, but I, I have some characters that I really like spending time with. And I found, at least with the Knicks, that that's like priority number one. Like mm. you're, you have to spend a lot of time with these people and like inhabiting their, their point of view and being in their heads. So so you, you better like it. Um, so I like spending time with these people. So hopefully hopefully when, when the traveling is over, I can, I can, I can knock it out pretty quickly, like, <laughs> like six years. <laughs> There's no rush, is there? <laughs> Great. We have an... Excellent. We have another question. Um, I wanted to ask about the ending of the book, and I don't mean the, the various plot conclusions, but mm. the little reflection at the end, which is almost like a sermon yes, about all of the uh, things Samuel has learned and... Grown and I loved it, but I was sort of astonished that it was there because it seemed so not cynical. And I wondered uh, why it's there, and was there any pressure to remove it? Because it, it actually made me think at the time. I'm surprised some editor didn't kill this off, but I'm so glad they didn't. Thank you so much. Uh, it's funny that you say it's a it's a sermon um, on Twitter. A uh, a pastor actually tweeted the other day that he was using it in his actual sermon. Wow. <laughs> Which actually made me happy. Um, uh. Yeah, I, it, it is. It's, um, it's very kind of uh, uh, wearing your heart on your sleeve, that, the, those last like four or five pages. Uh, and I guess, uh, I don't know, like I'm asking you to read a 620 page book. And I thought if I were, if I, this is one reason. If I if I was just a jerk at the end, that would be that'd be pretty mean to you, you know. After like doing all this work, and then it's like, and then everybody died. Sorry, um, I, I just didn't feel right about that. But but second, the more overriding reason is that um, is that Samuel's kind of sermon at the end really reflects the stuff that 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 happened to me along the way. And I, f I thought it would be disingenuous if I, if I didn't include that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he, 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 he turns into someone that is um, hopefully a little more self-reflective um, and hopefully realizes that, that the, 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 the reasons he was unhappy in, uh, at the beginning of the novel um, uh, were, were in some ways created by himself, and he didn't understand his own complicity in the in the world that he was mm. creating. Um, uh, I think I write about uh, about how sometimes um, you don't realize that that uh, that the world is 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 uh, is a result of the the habits you, you you're making yourself. You know, mm. thousands of tiny decisions made day after day after day create a kind of world, um, and uh, and and the work of the novel hopefully is is Samuel chipping out of that world, you know? And, and that kind of mimics my, my own kind of path through writing the novel. So I guess, I guess, you know, I'd gone through 600 pages of, there's a lot of cynicism in there. There's a lot of really biting satire. I figured I earned like four pages of sappiness, you know, four <laughs> pages of cheesiness. Uh, hopefully you'll let me, you'll allow me to get away with it. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm really happy that you liked it. Yeah, I think we'll allow that. There's loads more questions from the audience. We haven't even talked about tennis. Tennis, yeah. I, one of the first things I did when I arrived in Melbourne is to go walk around uh, Melbourne Park. I'm such a tennis geek that I was like, I have to see Rod Laver Arena. Um, so yeah, I went down there for a tour and then it turned out yesterday, the only day I could do it, the tour guide called in sick. So there was no, <laughs> <laughs> no tours not to come out. My wife and I have been planning on coming for the tournament. Uh, oh, wow. so, so yeah, some one January, uh, one of these days. But how about that final this year, right? Yeah. Oh my God, it was so good. Uh, especially after... Um, when I saw Roger lose to Rafa a few years ago here mm. and he cried on court, he mm. made me cry, yeah. you know, halfway around the world. I was so happy to see this, this result. I love Rafa too, but I mean, come on, that was a great match. Have you got a favorite tennis player of all time? 
of all time. I mean, it's hard to it's hard to argue um, with with Federer. I mean, the guy mm. is uh, is such a his his game is is so brilliant, and he's also just seems for all as far as I can tell, just such a great guy, mm. you know. So yeah, it's hard to it's hard to argue with that. It is hard to yeah. argue with that, isn't it? Okay. Could you talk a little bit more about the idea about whether you you said you like spending time with the characters in your new novel? Um, I love the Knicks, but I actually had to put it down at one point because I found the characters so annoying. And I mean that as a, I mean that as a compliment. They were so vividly drawn that I was like, I cannot spend any any more time with these people. Mm-hmm. I need you know I need a bit of a break. And then I came back to it because I wanted to know what happened to them. So it's, testament to the strength of the writing but can you talk about how you think about where that line is about the how how likable you you need to make them and you want Mm. to make them oh yeah thank you um is there anybody in particular who really annoyed you (laughs) oh you don't have a mic anymore is there anybody in particular Laura, okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, Mm. well thanks for coming back to the book that's nice (laughs) uh um yeah, um, I, I guess I don't mean, I don't mean that the characters are likable. Um, mm. I don't, I don't think that's what I mean. I, I think, I, I enjoy inhabiting their perspective, um, and that's different from them being likable. Uh, I loved every scene I got to write with, with Periwinkle. Um, Periwinkle, if you haven't read the book, is this like media guru, book publisher kind of guy, and uh, and he is he he is uh, so opinionated and so cynical, and uh, and in some ways just such a rotten guy. But I loved inhabiting that point of view. You know, it's just really entertaining. Same thing with Laura. Like in some ways, um, you know how like in movies sometimes the bad guy is the most interesting, the, mm. the most compelling. And same thing with Laura. Like uh, I, like um, she's not somebody I would want to encounter in. Real life but I loved being able to write her and so I Mm. guess that's what I mean um, by enjoying enjoying myself like um, uh, not I want to spend time with them for a lot of reasons sometimes it's because I I find them very sympathetic like Samuel or Faye but Mm. it's also sometimes just that they entertain me a lot just to be able Mm. to inhabit them and that's probably true with Ponage and Periwinkle Mm. and 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 Laura I had um, as Periwinkle I had kind of a Robert Downey Jr maybe it was from that the Wonder Boys the the yeah. uh, movie of that where he's this kind of publisher is that know, right so, yeah that's, that's good yeah, yeah that's good casting yeah well, I, I was, actually there's I, it, gonna be a movie isn't there uh, a TV show yeah a TV show in, so do you get to choose in the works uh, I I don't think so uh, um, uh, yeah um, it's uh, very exciting Meryl Streep uh, um, <laughs> liked the book. Uh, and, uh, wow. and wants to play Faye. So, so we said yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Do you know any other cast? Oh, um, no, no more. Those, uh, casting hasn't happened yet. We right. know that J.J. Um, that Abrams is on yeah. board to direct and produce. We have this, uh, a great showrunner and adapter in John Logan. Um, and, uh, and right now we're working on, uh, working on some scripts. And so you're we're involved to, in that? Yeah, a little bit. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we're waiting to see where it's going to land. It's probably going to be a, a, a mini series, like maybe 10 episodes, one season. And, uh, yeah, that's all I know right now. How does that feel? To know that you're going to be on the screen. That you, uh, it's it's funny when my parents heard, they immediately knew exactly what scene they wanted to be extras in. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you've thought about this already. They're oh. like, yes, yes. In that scene, we want to be in that. Which in, scene? Uh, it's a scene in 1968 in Chicago. There's this this moment where uh, where the protesters are all have all surrounded this particular restaurant uh, and bar in the Hilton, um, and they want to be in that bar. Oh wow! Yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't know why. Another question. I was really intrigued by your comments about uh, the reluctance of modern students to embrace fiction. And I was wondering, would it help? This is a crazy idea. I don't know where I got it from. If we renamed fiction Alternative Facts. (laughs) (laughs) 
um, when I heard <laughs> when I heard that phrase uh, uttered, um, I, I, I thought of something that Periwinkle says late in the novel, um, or it, it's something along the lines of, um, um, in case you haven't noticed, the world has given up uh, on antique ideas like true or false. Now I'll believe what I'll believe, and you believe what you believe, and we'll all yeah. agree to disagree. I think he calls it liberal tolerance. Tolerance meets dark ages denialism. <laughs> And, uh, and, and the funny thing about Periwinkle is that he just accepts it. He has no moral compass. And so it's just like, he doesn't care that that's how the world is. That's how it is. And so he's going yeah. to run with it, alternative fact or no. God, yes, another one here. Uh, yes, uh, let me just get back to the book. I just want to ask about a couple of characters who um, uh, lose touch with people who are important to them and then catch up with them later, mm. years later. Uh, Samuel catches up with his his mother, of course, but he also catches up with his girlfriend, mm -hmm. also a musician. <laughs> Inspiration for your wife, perhaps. Yeah. But, but Faye also uh, uh, catches up with um, Sebastian mm -hmm. and uh, her long-lost sister in Norway. So I'm mm -hmm. just wondering whether this was anything personal or, or not. Where it came from. Uh, um, I, I realised... Uh, I realized somewhere along the way that, of course, I was writing I was writing a, a book about uh, about people who are out of touch with each other, um, and uh, and and this this happens in in very very intimate ways, you know, with uh, uh, say Bethany and her twin brother uh, her Bishop, who has drifted apart um, and uh, and won't speak to her anymore. Um, it happens in other uh, uh, you know intimate way ways with uh, with Samuel and his mother who drifts apart and then it, it happens with um, with Ponage who slowly loses touch with with the people in his life because he's playing a video game and it happens to Laura who because she is uh, addicted to the social media app she is communicating through this app instead of communicating with people and it just seemed appropriate for a novel that was also about political polarization and rioting and protest because protest is after all, kind of the logical endpoint of a of a, of a society that can't speak to each other, you know, um, uh, where uh, and and so all these things seem to go together. It seemed like a nice synthesis. Uh, um, so I, I guess th that's that's where it came from. It came from a, a kind of intellectual place um, uh, that that thematically this all made sense together. Mm. Um, uh, personally. Uh, I don't know. Like I, I, my, 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 I'm, I'm under directions from my mother to tell everybody that she never abandoned us, uh, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and she's a she's a very warm and generous person, and and Faye at times uh, is very kind of cold and distant. Um, but I, I think if it came from that that sense of separation, if it came from anything in my life, it was probably from uh, what I at least what I what I drew upon the emotions I drew upon while I was writing was was um, when I was a kid we we moved around a lot from my my dad's job. Uh, we would stay anywhere for like two, maybe three years, and then we would, we would move again. This mm. was so growing up. This was life, um, and so you know nobody ever abandoned me. But moving when you're a kid kind of feels that way, mm. you know, that loneliness. Mm. So I guess I drew on that. Mm. Yes, up the back. You're a literary person. During the 10 years to uh, come up with the book, did you find yourself at times reading any novels? Yeah, every day. Um, uh, I, my, my, my routine, the way I kind of get into the day uh, is uh, I'll, I'll, I'll wake up and I'll make sure that my phone is face down. Uh, so I can't see anything that's happening in the world. Uh, email, text messages, whatever. I will have some coffee and I will read whatever novel I'm currently reading and it's almost mm -hmm. always a novel. I will read it for the length that it takes me to finish my coffee, maybe 15, 20 minutes. Um, and then I'll start writing. And and uh, and it's kind of how I get into the day. Um, I'll, I'll read later in the day too. And sometimes, you know, if I'm reading for a particular reason, I'll, 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 I'll do it a lot. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's how I, I, I get into language for the day. It's just reading whatever novel I happen to be reading um, at, that, at that moment. Um, and then I write, and the writing takes anywhere from, I don't know, a, a, like uh, an hour to maybe three. Um, my rule for myself when I'm writing is I, I handwritten, I write uh, five to seven pages a day um, mm -hmm. on, on, you know, 
small, small pieces of paper, um, a small notebook, five to seven pages a day. Uh, and uh, uh, the reason for that rule is, uh, is I feel like on days where it's going poorly, I can at least excrete five pages. Mm -hmm. You know, I can do five pages. It's hard, but I'll get five pages done. Um, and then I'll stop myself. Like, thank God that's over and mm -hmm. go do something else. Um, but on days that it's going really well, uh, I could probably write many more pages than seven, but I will stop myself at seven because then tomorrow I know exactly where I will start. And then hopefully I can do seven pages that day and stop and mm -hmm. know right where I'm going to start the next day. And hopefully I can. So like having that daily habit um, mm -hmm. is much more important than, than kind of binge writing on any given day. Uh, so that's how I do it. And yeah, so I'm, I'm reading novels constantly and it's kind of how I introduce myself to the day. So you start writing before you've checked your phone? Yeah, and then once my five to seven pages are up, then I'll usually, you know, I'll check my, check my phone over lunch and mm -hmm. then go on with a kind of normal day. Everyone's making copious notes to change <laughs> their writing habits because that's going to produce the next something the next bit <laughs> well we are right we're running out of time but fortunately everyone's going to be able to meet you and get book signings but please everybody first give nathan hill a big round of applause thank you thanks for coming thank you. visit wheelercenter.com for the best in books writing and ideas from melbourne australia and the world